We are on. Uh, welcome to Red May, your chance to take a vacation from capitalism for one month. You can riff on red, eat red food, wear red garments, and of course, read a lot of Karl Marx. Uh, today we have a panel on the unipolar moment. What does that mean? Well, I'll go to our moderator to tell you he's Daniel Bessner, uh, who is a professor of international studies at the University of Washington. Uh, Daniel works on intellectual and cultural history, U.S. foreign relations, the history of democratic thought, and the history of the social sciences. He's the author of Democracy in Exile, Hans Spire, and the Rise of the Defense Intellectual, and is working on a book on the Rand Corporation. Uh, hello, Daniel, and uh, nice to have you back at Red May for the nth time. <laughs> Happy to be back. Um, thank you so much, uh, Philip, for organizing this panel and for bringing um, our panelists together, Asal Rod, Spencer Ackerman, and Derek Davison, uh, three of the most important and astute uh, analysts of U.S. foreign policy, I think, um, writing today. Uh, writing and speaking uh, today. So so thank you for that. So the panel is going to be organized less around specific talks, but really around um, conversations and questions that people have. So please, uh, they're able to write their comments in the chat. And so um, please, if you're able to do so, uh, that would be great. And we could go off of those, but I could also lead the conversation because I think we're in a very important moment. And maybe this will be my first provocation. Uh, that's like, I guess that's a term like academics use. <laughs> so silly. Uh, this will be like my first uh, comment or question, um, which is that I think this moment is unique in a variety of ways, variety of reasons. I, I think that we're entering the first post post Cold War moment where the era of American unilateralism um, it has really come to a definitive end. Um, but at the same time that this unilateralism has come to an end with obviously the quote unquote rise of China, but also I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine has demonstrated that um, there are going to be moves being made that um, other states wouldn't have done in the 1990s and 2000s. I think we're nevertheless going to see a continuation of the American empire as, as the, the armed hegemon, as, as the prime military power and likely economic power for the foreseeable future. Um, and I think that that's really important because this is a moment that I don't think we've seen really in modern history where you have the, the relative decline of one power, but nevertheless, um, a power that will remain the imperial hegemon for now and the foreseeable future um, and will also... Uh, be able to run this empire because you don't need actually need that many people to run this this thing. Um, and so I think it's a really unique moment, and particularly after Ukraine, which I think reignited a lot of latent liberal internationalism of people who who feel themselves to be on on the quote unquote left, whatever that means, but who nevertheless want to do things like arm Ukraine, want to send weapons to Ukraine. There's been discussions about turning it into a proxy war to re weaken Russia and all of these things that that were at least in retreat after Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, and Libya, but are now once again back in full force. So I was wondering if the panelists would like to comment on, on that provocation and tell me if you think I'm right, if you think I'm wrong, if you think I'm understanding where U.S. foreign policy actually is. And uh, we could start with whomever. So if you want to just jump in, I think that would be great. I'll jump in. <clears throat> I'll jump in. Thanks, Daniel. Um, Real excited to be here on this panel. Thank you to Philip for organizing it. Um, really looking forward to talking with um, with you guys today. Um, you mentioned, you know, I think what you said about, uh, you know, experiencing the end of unipolarity um, is certainly something that distinguishes this moment. But I'm not so sure if we've entered a, a post cold a post post Cold War moment. It seems like we've entered a sort of threshold to doing two cold wars at the same time. And especially with a lot of <clears throat> uh, really well-tread, um, certainly in elite politics, but also in the broader culture, um, a custom over the, the course of the last 70 years toward um, post-Cold War, I'm sorry, toward Cold War politics, the way those things get racialized, uh, the way that 
they empower the defense industry, the way capital rallies to them. It seems to me that, you know, the, the, the targets of the Cold War switch around, but the imperatives and the interests behind them remain um, perhaps, um, you know, transformed um, with new uh, entrants entering into the circumstance, like with, um, you know, the, the, the rise of a data economy, what um, Shoshana, uh, Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism. Um, which is certainly a, a field of material competition um, as well as digital competition um, over, you know, manufactured resources like semiconductors and the, um, the raw resources um, that uh, the combatants in, in a, you know, conflict for geopolitical and geoeconomic hegemony um, will contest um, at a great loss of life. Similar today, um, you know, uh, the leaders of Finland and Sweden were at the White House, uh, so uh, President Biden could um, talk enthusiastically about how the West, meaning NATO, uh, has a rejuvenated purpose that no one anymore doubts if there is a need for NATO um, in the 21st century, which I think, you know, probably certainly myself, probably others on this panel really do want to keep in question. Um, and then finally, I would just say, you know, were the proxy wars really ever in retreat? The war on terror, um, which is the primary subject that I cover journalistically, is filled with them. Uh, you know, Syria most prominently of all in these conflicts, and that was most certainly a proxy conflict, um, certainly after uh, the 2015 intervention by the Russians between the U.S. and Russia. Um, you know, so much of American politics during the Trump era feels like as well uh, a kind of political proxy war uh, between the U.S. and Russia. And I guess the last thing I would say sort of as a top line um, that, um, you know, I'd be very interested in people's comments on if they want to give them, but that I think there is a tendency when we talk about the lack of the, the dwindling moments of, U of U.S. unipolarity to confuse that with a sense of either, um, you know, massively increasing multipolarity or a, you know, retreat into um, eclipse, if not irrelevance of, of U.S. foreign policy. I think, you know, Daniel, from what you said, certainly you don't exhibit that, but I, I just think it's um, important to point that out. You know, the U.S. has an unrivaled network of military uh, bases around the world, um, optimized both for both land sea um, and air operations. Uh, space is increasingly a major aspect of uh, Russia, Chinese, Iranian, soon to be Indian, certainly US um, uh, militarization as well, a theater of conflict. Um, and you know, when China overtakes the United States as the world's largest economy, the US economy will just become the second largest um, as well um, with its you know, deep relationship, embedded relationship, architectural relationship, I would say, um, within the international, both economic and geopolitical systems, these things are force multipliers for American foreign policy well out into the future. So I think we, we want to be a little bit careful when we talk about what the impact of the end of U.S. unipolarity means, because we end up, we may end up uh, judging it more granularly than we might anticipate at this stage. And just um, before I throw it to the panelists, uh, a uh, for a few years now, actually, I think China has actually surpassed the U.S. in purchasing power parity per capita. So according to some measures, it already is the largest um economy on earth and just to underline what spencer said if you if you compare it to the cold war the us and the soviet union really barely traded with each other for the duration of the cold war and and china is now one of the united states' largest trading partners so despite all this talk about a new cold war i think it's important to take those material factors into account so uh does asal or derek want to jump in whoever would like to please do Um, I mean, I think you you guys have made some good points, and I I want to thank the the folks at Redmay for uh, putting this panel together. I'm very very uh, honored to be a part of it. Um, I, I I feel like the end of unipolarity is happening in the imaginations of a lot of people in D.C. To I would say in some cases glee. I, I feel like uh, they there is a sense in Washington that they've ridden this war on terror train as far as it'll go uh, in terms of justifying 
$700 billion military budgets. But if you want to get up to that trillion, if you want to get to the magic number, uh, you need an existential threat. You need the kind of a threat that, that only a China or a Russia can provide. Uh, and so I, I feel almost like there is a, a happiness to be returning to a more normal, if you will, uh, time when there's a great enemy or a couple of great enemies, as Spencer alluded to. Um, in some sense, I, I wonder if the way that the war in Ukraine is going is, is sort of spoiling that a bit, because we see that uh, uh, while Russia still has the nukes, and that's that's obviously a major threat, the the their conventional military is not holding up its end of the, the bargain, so to speak. Um, but Danny, one the, what you just said is one of the things that I come back to over and over again, is, is you try to sort out what this moment actually looks like. And, and this drumbeat of the new cold war you know or the new cold wars uh it's it's much different it's much different to talk about a, a cold quote unquote cold war between the united states and china who are so economically intertwined with one another um as to be you know inseparable unless you want to uh, really tear apart the global economy and and in trying to separate these two countries um so i i, I feel like we're gonna need a new way of trying to analyze this, the, it, it, the, the Cold War framework doesn't work uh, to me, but, you know, that's, uh, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure we'll figure that something out, right, as we move into uh, what is definitely an era of competition. It's going to be an era of tension. Uh, it's going to be an era that's probably interrupted abruptly at some point by climate change, but that's a separate issue we get into. Derek, I'm actually happy that you brought up climate change. And the reason is because while, I mean, we're having these conversations, to me, when you look at it from a larger historical perspective, right? It's like when we talk about the Cold War, we're acting like wars of empires did not happen for hundreds of years before that. We're ignoring sort of the establishment of the United States and how it exists, the the, the roots of why we exist in the way we do today. You know, it's always like, well, the, the U.S. has been at war for 70 years. No, the U.S. has been at war for, you know, hundreds of years. It's been at war since the day it, uh, it came into existence. And and when when you talk about the idea of decline, when you also look at it from that like longer historical perspective, I do think it's it's uh, it's fair in these sort of context of the unipol the end of the unipolar power um, in the sense that there is growing competition from states like China economically, from states like Russia who are who are coming back to sort of that notion of expansionism. But decline in a historical perspective takes a long time. Right. You can be in decline, but still have power for many years to come. I mean, that decline could take a century. Um, and, and it's it's hard to think about it in those terms, because sometimes, you know, we're obviously thinking of our own lifespans and our own moments and, and how we're witnessing things as they unfold. But that doesn't change the future of what we're going to deal with and what generations to come are going to deal with. And that's why I thought bringing up climate was so important, because. You know, we talk about the Cold War framework, but but in my mind, the post uh, sort of world war framework, I think is so important to to remember, right? The idea that we were, you know, after uh, World War One, we created the League of Nations, after World War, that obviously became defunct. After World War Two, we created the United Nations. And none of these things, I mean, you could say that the United Nations is not defunct in the way that the League of Nations was, but does it actually perform what its intended duty is? No, because it was never allowed to because in reality, you would actually have to have an end to empires, right? You, you would have to end empire to make the notion of sovereignty and international rules and international law all work. But when you have the most powerful states, especially the most powerful country, which currently exists and has so for several decades, um, sort of exploiting those systems, we've never actually seen them fulfilled. And we are going to deal with, you know, existential threats during the Cold War were about nuclear weapons. That was the existential threat. But with climate, it's a very different beast. It's a very different situation that we're going to have to deal with. And sort of how we're going to deal with things moving forward, uh, especially how powerful nations are going to deal with it, I think will be very much linked with something like climate and the threat that it will actually pose and how it will change the balance of things, which is obviously difficult to predict, but, um, but certainly something that we should keep in mind. 
And particularly just building off that point about climate, it does seem to me from what I understand, and I am by no means an expert, from, but from things that I've read and people that I've spoken with, um, it seems like the United States might not actually be hit, quote unquote, that hard by climate change, at least in the next 50-ish years. Um, that'll be other parts of the world, particularly the global south, that are going to be really hit poor, um, badly and that there's gonna that's going to engender a ton of migration, which is going to deracinate people and, and resist result in an enormous amount of death and destruction, but that we in the United States are not going to really face the consequences of our incredible energy consumption or or, or just our incredible consumption in general. So I worry about um, basically that, like the United States, you know, they'll, 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 they're concerned with protecting supply chains, but I think we could, we already consume so much that we could like lessen our consumption a little bit and still live relatively nice lives while we let the rest of the world both literally and proverbially burn. So I was just wondering what people, you know, uh, that perhaps it's a provocative statement, but let's say the U S it doesn't really get the worst of climate change, at least in a, on a quote unquote political time span. What do you see happening then? And you could take that question in, in any um, form that you would like, and please, whoever likes to jump in. No one minds. Um, <clears throat> you know, it may be cliche to say it at this point, but we've gotten a preview of it from COVID. Um, you know, we lost, you know, a million dead without uh, the US economy cratering, without it prompting the kinds of, you know, historically speaking, you know, massive political um, upheavals um, that, that perhaps it might have um, sort of, I think, provides a really ominous sense of, you know, what, you know, how deep a death grip on the concept of, you know, quote unquote, climate normalcy um, American elites um, will be invested in and instill upon um, upon you know people in America with the obvious um, you know dire effects on you know people around the world who will experience it um, more than Americans will on a, on a more rapid timetable. To pick up something that you said, Derek, you know I I think there there you make excellent points about um, why a Cold War framework doesn't capture the economic relationship between the United States and China. I think the trouble is, is that this is a circumstance where like you might not be interested in the dialectic, but the dialectic is very much interested in you, where like this, precisely this sense of avoidance of uh, climate, of the burden that uh, the capitalist led destruction of, um, you know, our, our common habitat has on our politics has been with things like um, the the rush to you know fight two forms of cold war at the same time as a way of making sure that uh, a possibility of a reordered foreign policy around a collective global burden um, that the United States and other developed economies and certainly the United States above all. Uh, powers and has brought the United has brought the world to this point. Um, the the you know return to Cold War politics and entrenchment of Cold War politics, you know, may not foreclose on this prospect, but it defers it as much as possible until some other political force in the United States um, demands and overcomes obstacles uh, to make our politics. Uh, something that can be compatible with what it will actually take to make sure as many of us survive um, the coming climate catastrophes as possible. Would anyone else like to jump? Derek, please. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I think Spencer's, Spencer, you're, you're absolutely right. We have gotten a look at what the world is prepared to do or specifically what the United States is prepared to do in the face of a global challenge that requires a global collaborative response that isn't about competition, that, that isn't about uh, staring at another country's military across, you know, $500 billion of hardware or, or um, you know, that type of conflict, but is a problem that needs to be solved uh, together. And the answer is we're not prepared to do anything. I mean, you know, that's a million, you talk about a million dead, that's just in the United States and hasn't moved the needle at all. You know, talk about the other 5 million plus 
uh, who have died around the world. Uh, and that's registered less than zero uh, for the United States or for the U.S. government. Uh, you know, the, the World Health Organization, I think just this week, uh, said, you know, look, we're, we're, it was a panel that they had set up, uh, issued a little report, said uh, the world is in the exactly the same place right now if there was another pandemic. Uh, we've done nothing to improve governance. We've done nothing to improve finance. We've done nothing to prepare for the next pandemic, having just come out of this very experience. So the idea that we're all going to suddenly be able to work together on a problem of orders of magnitude greater, uh, climate change, is, uh, you know, I think fantasy. And, and uh, you know, I said this, uh, Danny and I have a podcast uh, together, American Prestige, and I think I said this in, in one of our interviews a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what was really eye-opening to me about the pandemic uh, was, you know, I was always like skeptical about the 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 ability of, um, you know, the United States or of, of you know countries in general, the humanity, let's say, to work together to to solve a problem like climate change. What the pandemic showed me is that you could literally get to the point where, you know, people are up to their ankles in water, and if they turn around and there's a guy who's up to his chest. They're going to say, well, I'm OK. You know, we don't need to do anything. Uh, and it's it's extraordinarily disheartening. But I, I, I'm more skeptical than ever about, uh, you know, the ability uh, to deal with these kinds of challenges. I, I wanted to add that a, I agree with everything you guys are saying, right? Like the, the pandemic, not only did the pandemic show that we are totally ill prepared to deal with anything that requires not even a global response, just a national response. <laughs> Any response, really. <laughs> exactly. Just just something that makes it seem like this is important, too. Um, I mean, look at the fact that we just, uh, the, the, the Biden administration just decoupled uh, COVID funding to make sure the most important priority, Ukraine gets funding. We want to talk about climate. Uh, Ukraine has been guaranteed $54 billion of funding in two months. Uh, the entire 2023 budget for climate is 44 billion. So these are the clear, I mean, the priorities are the same Cold War mentalities, right? That is the priority. The priority is war. And I think there's also, by the way, I forgot this, um, wealth. What's happened with wealth in COVID, right? It's not only has it brought all of the sort of systemic problems to the surface, but look, just look at how much wealth was accumulated and hoarded again by the wealthiest in the world, right? With billionaires made something like $2 trillion in COVID, during COVID, as people are not only dying, um, we look at numbers like, you know, five, six million people have died from COVID. Those are direct deaths. We're not talking about indirect deaths. We're not talking about the site, I mean, the, the, uh, psychological, the, the, the mental health issues that have come with COVID, the economic issues that have come with COVID, which, you know, we can talk about that $2 trillion the billionaires have made, but everybody else isn't doing great economically in COVID. Um, and so, no, we have no, and by we, I mean the US government at least, has absolutely no reason to, to feel like it has to deal with it because, you know, in reality, the, the people who are being elected and who is electing them are doing fine. Right. They're doing fine. And when I say the people who are electing them, I mean, the people who are paid, who are paying them to get elected, not the actual voters who are electing them uh, when we're left with two not so great options, if we're being totally honest. Right. Um, it's it's hard to. And that's what I meant when I said earlier, the idea of decline. This this is exactly the, the like red flags of decline. Right. We're just going to bullheadedly go forward with the same policies that have failed the masses at least for decades, but we're just going to keep doing it. And we're going to do it until basically it implodes in our faces. That's the hubris. That's the sort of arrogance that comes historically with empire, right? When you're at the peak, that's why you decline because the assumption is this has worked for this long. There's no reason to believe it's not going to work forever, except for the fact that the one, you know, sort of lesson you can take from history is they always decline. There's no empire that has lasted, um, forever. And in terms of the amount of time that imperial powers have lasted, the U.S. is really not that far along. I mean, in terms of uh, the Ottoman Empire was around for 600 years. The U.S. has only been around for 250 years, and it has not been this sort of like large empire with global reach for that amount of time. So, so our concept of time and where we are is so distorted that we don't, it's almost like we've sort of jumped off a cliff. And as long as we're floating, we don't realize that there's a bottom to hit. 
Thank you very it's much. It's better to burn out than fade away. That's beautiful. Kurt Cobain's suicide note and Neil Young. Uh, thank you very much, Asal, Derek, and Spencer. So let me ask this question. Um, and it's about the left because this is, after all, Red May. Um, so from where I stand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, we're in a pretty dismal position. There, there's no real international left to speak of. Domestically, we're clearly um, very weak. And, and people get mad at me for this, but uh, it seems to be that a lot of the tactics that the left has historically relied on uh, don't really work anymore when trying to make political change in a lot of different arenas. Maybe maybe my, my, my view is too long. Maybe in 15 or 20 years, we'll see um, a lot of the political change. But, you know, basically since Occupy Wall Street, there's been an actually identified socialist left, and we haven't really done anything uh, in terms of uh, specific policy changes. I think we've changed the way people think. Um, I think we've changed the, the, the discourse of elite media in a lot of regards. Um, but I think what, what a traditionally socialist left focused on material redistribution, uh, we haven't really achieved much or a particular anti-imperialist left hasn't really uh, achieved much. I'm not sure, sure if withdrawing from Afghanistan after 20 years is like an apocalypse achievement or whether that's even attributed to the left. Um, so first of all, please tell me if I'm wrong and that I'm being too pessimistic. In my mind, pessimism is really just another word for realism and the way to actually change things is to be realistic but please tell me if i'm wrong um and or or what you think that we could possibly do which as asal said in a uh, in a word a world where ordinary people really don't have much effect on um public policy particularly when it comes to foreign policy i can say something uh so something i want i i, I think about when we talk about like the left is um or the left or the right, or, you know, there's just this, this entire notion of the political spectrum. Um, it's so difficult to define, especially because it's contextually driven, right? What is right and left in the United States and what is right and left in Norway are two completely different things. So, but I, I understand what you mean in terms of like the sort of traditional def definitions that we're thinking about. But one of the things I would note in terms of people's power, right? Like, what can we do if, if we're, if we are in fact, and I and I agree with you, Daniel, to a certain extent, that the, the the left has not shown, especially on an international scale, any kind of cohesion to be able to create the type of movement that's required um, to sort of uh, challenge these forces that maintain the status quo. I would kind of look at the progressive movement in like the early twentieth century in the United States, right? So we we had a very similar situation a hundred so years ago in the U.S., where you had you know mass concentration of wealth. Um, the government wasn't really a government of the people, so to speak. It was run by corporations, right? Corporations weren't regulated. You had monopolies. You had all of this sort of concentrated control of, of wealth and power. Um, and you, we can see the parallels in, into how we exist right now. What was interesting about the progressive movement is it wasn't, you know, this like one, they talk about it like it's a movement, but it wasn't this like one cohesive group of people. It was different groups with totally different um, sort of, objectives and goals, but they came under this larger umbrella, really just going against the status quo, challenging what the status quo was for different reasons, whether it was, you know, women's suffrage, whether it was about the you know, breaking up banks. And I think one of the issues that I would raise right now is the sort of cannibalism that exists in, in leftist conversations where you know, it's it's as if, and I think maybe social media has something to do with this, just the way that discourse exists now and the toxicity of discourse is that, you know, if we don't agree on everything, then you're the enemy. And that's not that's not going to get us anywhere, right? Because no one agrees on everything. Um, you know, and just I, very I, quick tangent on that. I think that's a reflection of the lack of political power because people can't actually change things. So they make politics their identity, like they make liking a rock band uh, or a sport and identity. So it becomes an attack on them. But sorry to interrupt. No, I mean, that was it, you know, and, and I don't disagree. Um, and it's not to say that criticisms that people make are not uh, fair criticisms to be made. But I do think that there needs to, in, in order to actually have the ability to challenge a very, very powerful status quo, it does require a little bit more cooperation where, you know, if, we, if you mostly agree, it's just we need to use that energy a little bit more. I would go further than I would. I mean, I, I saw I think those are great points. I would actually go further than what Danny said. I think 
um, the the prospect or, or some, something you started to say, Danny, the, the prospect of material change through politics has been so badly foreclosed. Uh, you know, it feels like forever since there was an actual, um, you know, actual notion that you could go to the ballot box, vote for a candidate, and somehow your material conditions would improve measurably because of one candidate versus the other. Um, you know, you can go back to the response to the 2008 financial crash when we bailed out banks and left people to, to drown in their, their uh, underwater mortgages. Uh, you can go back as recently as this weekend when our esteemed Treasury Secretary said that, uh, sorry, there's nothing the government can do about the baby food crisis because the ba baby formula crisis, because we're a capitalist country and the government does not make baby formula. Like it's just an immutable fact that this is the way things are and this is the way they must be. Um, it, it's, it, you know, it, it is the reason I think uh, to a, to a significant extent why politics has become so much about vibes. It's like, you know, uh, you know, we get into these heated debates about movies and, and uh, uh, you know, cultural issues that are important, but they're they're tangential to the question of uh, what are we doing to materially improve people's lives? Uh, but but there isn't a path. And I think that that's, you know, you see people kind of shunting themselves into these teams and getting so angry over these uh, cultural issues, partly because people just don't see any other path forward like there's there's no alternative to uh to you know way of expressing your your frustration with material conditions that are deteriorating seemingly no matter who's in charge i guess all i would add from that is that <clears throat> you know thinking about the question um all the times i've been to iraq afghanistan um you know places uh you know, where there is, um, you know, strong, to say the least, antipathy to the United States, outright resistance and so forth. Um, and, you know, other places around the world I've reported that aren't um, war zones. Um, no one I talk to really expects there to be a left in America with any kind of power. It's it's just, so I don't, I don't quite have like a, a full take on it. And this is never like, the subject of like one conversation that I had with you, I'm just sort of drawing out bits and pieces into, you know, an observation that's sort of, you know, dawning on me in real time. So bear with me, but um, they're never, I never got, no one, no one expected that the United States, you know, with having experienced uh, the worst, uh, you know, that the United States has to offer people overseas, no one expected the United States to, to be changed into something different. And I, I wonder if, you know, if there is to be an internationalist left in the United States, um, first, we should act with the recognition that, you know, given that it's the United States that does so much damage to the rest of the world, that should be a sense of obligation on us. And then secondly, that to form an internationalist left in the United States, you know, probably we want to start from the position of listening and not kind of taking a, you know, default American position that like we should be at the fore of these conversations as opposed to, you know, what we can do to ameliorate um, and stand in solidarity to the people around the world that America damages. I think to your point, Spencer, and to something that Asal said about, um, you, you know, what is left in the United States is not necessarily left in Norway or some other, you know, some other part of Europe or, or uh, you know, outside of Europe, if you go uh, worldwide. Um, it is important to try and have these discussions because, you know, as, a, as a, somebody who comes at foreign policy from the left in the United States, I have a perspective, for example, on NATO. Uh, or NATO expansion uh, that may be quite different from the perspective of somebody on the left in Ukraine right now or in Finland or Sweden. Um, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily going to compromise that position. Uh, but I think it's important to have the conversation because the, these are uh, di vastly different perspectives that are going to, going to 
<laughs> result in in you know putting people in different places. And uh, you know, to Asal's point, uh, you can't just sort of retreat to your corner and say, you know, well, that person doesn't agree with me about this. They're the enemy. Uh, you, you have to be able to discuss these things and, and uh, you know, in a sort of sense that everybody's trying to pull in the same direction. So that, I think, brings us pretty naturally to Ukraine. Um, and I was personally, maybe I shouldn't have been, but personally surprised at how many people were in favor of what I took to be a relatively aggressive U.S. position on the issue. People who were previously supporters of uh, Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, I think, took a relatively aggressive position on it. So I would love to hear what you all think about Ukraine and in particular, what you think about the response that you've witnessed amongst basically the U.S. elite toward Ukraine. You, I, I, I was I was a bit surprised to see that this very strong return of liberal internationalism, but maybe I was um, a bit naive. I'll go. Okay. Yes, please. Um, Spencer, please. Some you know something that I I try and keep in mind um, when assessing like the um, the relative strengths of, of liberal internationalism um, is, is just that like, it's five years between the fall of Saigon and, um, and Reagan in office. It's six years until, six, se uh, seven years, I guess, until Reagan uh, orders the Marines into Lebanon. So like an eye blink. Um, I think uh, one of the most significant precursors to um, where uh, the aggressive position that you outlined, Danny, um, of U.S. elites toward Ukraine um, starts in Syria, um, where uh, there was, just to put it crudely, like a sense amongst um, hawks in the Obama administration and the would-be Clinton administration that you could kind of, you know, ignore um, the damage of the war on terror, even though that is inextricable to the Syrian crisis, and say that like no lesson about the United States' abject catastrophes in Iraq or Afghanistan has to be learned. You can just simply feel righteous enough about starting an arms pipeline and good things will result. And they may seem bad, but the balance of terror will ultimately favor you know, our modern rebels and oops, there's ISIS, you know? So like that, I think is um, something that, that kind of, you know, served as a bit of like a calisthenic warm up um, to uh, what we have in Syria. And like similarly, you know, from, you know, around that same time, um, the, you know, Russian grabbing Crimea um, began this kind of sense that like, you know, I'll just tell you, you know, from covering, the Pentagon, I've been doing this about 20 years now, and from covering the Pentagon, covering this through like the high key years of the of like the occupation of Iraq, like the high key, like Bush administration, early Obama administration era of the war on terror, amongst like you know, colonels in higher, captains in the Navy in higher, and like their equivalents across you know, diplomacy and intelligence, there was always this sense that like, as much as they would talk about the war on terror being this like necessary generational struggle, that it was a diversion from the real thing that they're always and I think, Derek, you brought this up earlier, there was a real enthusiasm um, in 2017, when like, uh, you know, Jim Madison, H.R. McMaster or in the Trump administration saying like, all right, it's great power competition again. This is the thing we've been saying, like, ultimately will now get us out of the war on terror, even though, of course, no actual authorities, you know, funding lines and very few lines of operation in the war on terror have actually ended. Um, and I say that just to say that, um, you know, we are now on a trajectory where, you know, the the like the the actual battlefield questions that like the initial arms pipeline to Ukraine were supposed to have solved have solved. Like now the Russians have like retreated to um, this fallback position to capture Don, um, the Donbass, and like every day that the arms pipeline continues, I think is a day we rattle toward 
just frankly, um, you know, a, a disaster we may not really be able to, to comprehend because, you know, what the the Pentagon tried, you know, particularly in the first month of the um, of the pipeline to argue that, you know, in addition to not providing any air support, which is now eroded somewhat um, through a formula that suits this purpose, but basically like not giving the Ukrainians material that wasn't already in their arsenals was going to be what stays between the waterline of the Russians not considering NATO a combatant um, in Ukraine. And now that like, you know, the howitzers are, are, are flowing um, and, you know, there are, you know, uh, sort of what are called like kamikaze drones that sort of act like controllable missiles, um, the switchblades that uh, the U.S. sort of pioneers in Afghanistan, you know, those sorts of things. And then increasingly pressures for, for higher, um, you know, for higher degree capabilities, particularly if uh, the conflict really mires in the Donbass. There's always going to be these escalatory pressures, and the escalatory pressures that exist in this case are ones that make NATO a, comb a, a combatant here. And just like you know, we went in barely two months from the idea of a proxy war being something that you were never supposed to say was happening to one that like members of Congress openly talk about as a reason to keep the the weapons pipeline open. There is just going to become as the you know war. Um, you know, bods down, like an increasing chorus to more expressly break the stalemate on the on behalf of the Ukrainians to fight the war to the last Ukrainian, and that ultimately, um, you know, the Russians have their own sensibilities of what, and will always make that decision themselves about what constitutes NATO acting as a combatant. I wrote a piece um, a couple weeks into the war. Um, called um, Saving Ukraine Versus Defeating Russia. And like the point I was trying to make there was that like in the early stage of the war, you had sort of obscured these two goals because they look the same. That the United States was aiding the Ukrainians in order to like, you know, ensure their national survival. But in the background had been this sensibility from the start that this was you know, as much an opportunity as a tragedy that with the Russians miscalculating by their aggression in Ukraine, that this could be the thing that like gives Putin the military humiliation that he hadn't enjoyed, but that the United States had had pretty much nonstop on display these last 20 years. That's really interesting. Uh, Asal or Derek, would you like to jump in? I mean, I'd like to add a couple of things to to what Spencer just said. I think in addition to uh, the switchblade drones, which start to blur the line between uh, we're not going to provide air support to the Ukrainians and actually we are supplying, providing air support to the Ukrainians. The, I, the Intercept just did a piece yesterday about the push to go beyond switchblades and to start talking about sending reaper drones the you know the kinds of really heavy uh heavy drone fighters that that can do a tremendous amount of damage but really blur the line between you know what are you you providing and when does the you know when does this become a, a you know kind of uh nato uh, as a as a as a direct combatant in the war i mean there's uh you know talk about how quickly you can train ukrainian operators up on these things and uh you know how do we get them into the country and and uh, you know this is uh this is a serious potential escalation it's not maybe quite sending f16s but it's it's not that far off um the second thing i would say is in a in a sense i mean we've already crossed the combatant line. If you if you take the position as I do that economic warfare is warfare, then the United States and and uh, the European Union are waging war on Russia right now with with sanctions, with uh, you know freezing foreign uh, reserves, uh, you know, and the the measures that that they've already taken and the measures that may be taken down the road. I mean, Janet Yellen just uh, a couple of days ago said, you know, we're probably going to let this. Uh, carve out that we've allowed the Russians to pay their debt through expire, which means they're going to go into default because they're not going to have a way to service and make their debt service payments. 
um, just because it hasn't had the same degree of effect on Russia that it has uh, on countries like Iran or Venezuela uh, or North Korea. These measures are still acts of war, and that's what we're engaged in. It may not be a shooting war at that level, but uh, it's certainly warfare of a type. Certainly, I agree with that. Sorry, so I just want to jump in real quick and just to say that, like, I was not making an argument that the United States and NATO are, are not currently combatants. I was saying that, like, this is a, a diplomatic struggle of perception. Yeah, that, I'm that sorry. I wasn't, the, I wasn't you know, trying to say that yeah. you were. I, I, I apologize. But, uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to make that point. Uh, well, I, I'm glad Derek brought up economic warfare um, because we use these, like, phrases, right? We use sanctions um, uh, and then... Cold, I, I don't even like the phrase cold war, right? Because it implies it implies that they're not actually fighting each other. It's like, well, what does that even mean? When you're fighting in different places, you proxy wars, the, the language we use to describe these things is, is sort of absurd on its face, right? I mean, are people dying? Are you using military equipment to do things just because they're not on your own soil? It doesn't mean wars are not being carried out. They are constantly. Um, and the other thing I would say, that, you know, to Daniel, sort of like the original question, which was about the the almost zealous following of like international liberals of yes, you know, Ukraine, we have to support this war. Um, somehow, this has become an existential threat to the entire globe that this war is taking place now. No one can blame Ukrainians for wanting to defend their sovereignty, their country, their lives. Um, to an invader. There's no question to any of that. But the, one of the things that was sort of fascinating, and I'll be the, the brown elephant in the room, is the difference in how uh, this war, this invasion of a sovereign country was dealt with versus when the US invades or bombs sovereign countries. Um, and part of it, I think it's, it's hard to talk about it without talking about the fact that, that this, this sort of idea of how the how the war is framed. I mean, you had journalists in the first couple of weeks on, on you know, European, American, just across the board, shocked and just more upset, more upset, literally saying this is worse because they're blonde haired and blue eyed. And I, I find it difficult to separate that from that sort of overzealous reaction to why does everybody support um, why this, you know, all these businesses just shutting down in Russia. Everyone's saying they're going suddenly boycotting and, and sanctions and divestment. BDS makes sense, apparently, in this situation. Like the amount of double standards that we look at when we look at this particular conflict is frustrating. That shouldn't undermine the, the struggle of Ukrainians against an invading force. But at the same time, it, it helps to explain part of why you get such a different reaction. And I would add one thing. It's also, I mean, the way that the Biden administration has approached this from the beginning, from before the invasion, um, I think is quite telling of a, an administration that has struggled despite having, despite a democratic control of the House, the Senate, uh, the executive, of really getting things done, right? You, you hit the 1 million Americans dead from COVID threshold under Biden. We've seen, we we're dealing with uh, massive inflation, for from an American, I mean, for, you know, I'm not comparing it to say the inflation caused in countries that the U.S. sanctions, like Iran, like Venezuela, but at least from the American perspective, I mean, people are struggling. And so how do you also sort of deflect from that? Here's this massive threat. Here's this war. Let's get everybody behind it. And it's easier to do so when the people who are being harmed and attacked look like you versus the people who we have been harming and attacking for just decades because there's this idea that 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 violence comes naturally to that region right that, that the region it has nothing to do with violence that is imposed that is imported mostly from the united states to be completely honest it has nothing to do with that it's just you know naturally occurs for them whereas this is you know europe the location of two world wars apparently which have no bearing on on the violence that exists um within that particular region but but i do think that it's important to talk about the sort of ideological way and racialized ways in in how this conflict has been framed and why it has galvanized so many people in europe and the west to get behind it 
Yeah, and 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 also with very moral language, ironically, you know, to even question shipping arms, people just accuse one of being, you know, basically being an immoral bad person. So we're coming up on our time here. So I'm just going to give each of our panelists about a minute to to give any final thoughts or you know recommendations. People love panelists to have recommendations. So if you want to do that, I'll start with Spencer, then I will go to Derek, and then we'll end with Asal, and then I'll send it to uh, Philip. Uh, so Spencer, please. Sure. I don't know if I have any good. This is not a. a I'm just going to say right right about now. This is not a responsible recommendation because I haven't gotten around to reading this. Um, but because Derek brought up uh, the you know economic differences between um, the U.S. China relationship and the U.S. Soviet Cold War, I thought I would bring up uh, Ho Fung Hung's Clash of Empires, which apparently like goes into this in quite great detail, like the economic basis of what um, the relationship is currently and going forward within the political context um, of, of the current tensions. Thank you guys so much for doing this. Um, thanks to Red May. Thanks to Mike, who's engineering this. And thanks to Philip. Thanks to all of you. I've had such a great conversation. Derek. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not really the recommendations guy. <laughs> <laughs> listen to American uh, Prestige, man. That's the recommendation. American Prestige. Subscribe yeah, there to you our go. podcast. That's uh, the only check, sensible recommendation. <laughs> check us out, American Prestige. Uh, what is it? AmericanPrestigePod.com is the website. Uh, so. we're, we're on Substack. Come subscribe. Uh, uh, I think we're all uh, – Spencer's on Substack. I don't think Asal Yeah, Spencer's is. on Substack, too. Yeah. Uh, Asal, yeah, when are you going to make When are you going yeah, to join man? Substack? <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, 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 I, 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 <laughs> other, other than you know, listening to to our podcast, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have a lot of good recommendations. I'm, I'm very, very pessimistic, frankly, about uh, uh, where things are heading. I think they're going to get a lot worse, uh, and maybe they'll get a little better after that. But I don't know. Um, sorry to end on a downer. That's my specialty, though. Yeah, that's um, how we end and our and I I would I would join Spencer in in thanking uh, Red May and and thanks to all of you guys for for doing this panel. I, I it's been a really really fascinating discussion. And Asal, please your final thoughts. Well, it's hard to follow up on <laughs> <laughs> on a podcast recommendation <laughs> on that enthusiasm. But um, I will first of all obviously thank you uh, to Philip for organizing this, to Red May for organizing. Uh, everything they've done for this month. Um, I've very much enjoyed, you know, having, speaking with all of you. And I will try to be a little bit more optimistic than Derek. And it's not that I have a, a specific recommendation, but I guess I think it's just important to have these conversations, to engage each other, especially, I think it's especially important when we disagree. Um, and it's not, and I don't mean, you know, it's sort of pointless to have a conversation with somebody who's so far on the other side of the pole that they're not even, you know, they're that they're not willing to engage. But as to my earlier point, I think sometimes, um, people are rightfully frustrated, uh, by the fact that while their, their sort of standard of living and their livelihoods are declining, it seems like their ability to change anything is also, um, is also declining, but I don't want to be totally pessimistic. I want to believe the fact that if we can have these conversations, if we can, we can affect some kind of change into that system. And I will note the fact that that existed in the United States. You know, there's this uh, tendency to always compare the U.S. to say like Northern European countries, and then the responses. But those countries are different. I'm like, yeah, but I mean, if you look at if you look at the U.S., it's not it's not a, it's a deeply deeply flawed history, but changes have occurred, and so it is possible to do so. Um, and the only way I think to do it is to have a more informed citizenry, to have these conversations and to the point of what you guys are doing. Yeah. Podcasts, writing, like read things, watch things, listen to things that are not, that are different a little bit to get, to get more perspectives. Like Thank American you so much. And Spencer's, uh, subset. Thank you, Asal. And I just want to repeat everyone. Thank you for coming to this event and, uh, we'll close out with Philip. Philip, please. Yeah, you know, it's funny, the the subdued gloominess of everyone. That seems to be the affect of a number of Red May participants this year in different in different subjects. I, I appreciate it, Asal, the way you brought in the domestic roots of foreign policy. I reminds me of something that Andrew Basevich once said where uh, uh, 
most foreign policy is aimed at winning battles on the P Potomac. And uh, one sees with, uh, uh, with uh, Biden, who literally is, can't accomplish anything, as no Democratic president would probably be able to, uh, or will be able to in the future, since the Republicans have a, a kind of fascist playbook, which is just make Congress not work and so forth, that they're tempted in the foreign policy area where there are fewer restraints in what they do, and you might be able to lift yourself in the polls and be seen as a masculinist, active president before the next election. It, it's a gloomy, uh, a gloomy making thought. So I, I will leave on that, and at least we have uh, people, intelligent people, articulate people like you, uh, analyzing things and uh, giving us food for thought. So I, I want to do a pitch quickly now on Red May. Uh, we uh, have maybe 10 more events uh, for the rest of May, probably even more than that, 12. Uh, you can find them on our website, www.redmayseattle.org. Uh, in the next few days, we have uh, uh, a panel called Two or Three Things I Know About Brecht, another one called Art, Labor, and Value, uh, feminist the feminist economy, all kinds of very good things. You'll find it on www.redmayseattle.org. Uh, to survive, to keep doing this, and this is our sixth, fucking year. It's absolutely amazing to think that a commie festival could go for that long. Uh, who knew? Uh, we want to keep doing it for another six at least. So uh, go to donate. Uh, we have uh, Patreon where you can give to be a patron or uh, our GoFundMe, Fan the Flames of Red May. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you at the rest of our events.